Hi, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. In this video, we're doing our B660 motherboard roundup. We've taken a look at the entire market, we've conducted our own testing on a range of boards to better understand them, and we've looked at a load of other reviews and information sources, things like hardware and box VRM thermal testing, to ensure that we're making the best possible recommendations and getting you the best products for your money. The B660 motherboard lineup is really confusing, and there are a lot of pitfalls and traps in there as well. There are boards that lack basic features, boards that won't run the CPUs well, and boards that overheat. This is why we've done the hard work for you. We've looked through all the options, we've discounted the boards that we can't recommend, and these boards that we're going to recommend in this video are the ones that we're confident will form the basis for a really fantastic system that will serve you well. There are some basic pitfalls to avoid, and uh, I want to talk about those a little bit just before we get stuck into the things we are recommending. First up, some boards don't have adequate VRMs to run even i5 CPUs to their full potential, and those are boards that we would either caution only to run an i3 CPU on or to avoid entirely, so that if you do upgrade in future, you've still got an adequate platform to run a better CPU. A lot of these boards also exist in DDR5 variants, and you want to be really careful you don't buy a DDR5 board by mistake, or if you do, just return it and get a DDR4 board in its place. The value proposition of the older Lake platform is purely based on the fact that it performs around the level of a 5600X at the i5 level with a CPU that's $180. The minute you commit to an expensive DDR5 RAM spend, you obliterate the value proposition of this uh, platform, and DDR5 RAM at the moment, particularly for more affordable kits, performs worse than DDR4. So it's something you want to avoid for this generation. We also want to caution that in the context of B660 motherboards, unfortunately entry level does mean around $140 and up. Almost all of the boards below that we really can't recommend. They're just not good value, either due to underperformance or just a lack of basic features. You have to offset that cost against the good value of the cheaper i5 CPUs and really take the system cost as a whole into your value consideration when you're looking at these boards. And finally, we'd just say if you're thinking you could get away with running, for example, an i5 CPU on an H610 motherboard to save some money, we have looked at the H610 range. Um, it looks really poor value across the board. Despite some of the boards being slightly cheaper, they're still $80 to $110. And they, almost without exception, lack basic specifications and features that we need to be able to recommend a board to you as the basis for a PC. They've got inadequate VRMs, which mean that they won't run more powerful CPUs well, only two RAM slots as a rule, normally only one M.2 slot, a really basic PCIe and USB configuration that mean they're just gonna compromise any PC that's built with them. We'd suggest that you use them for an i3 for like an office or very basic PC, but for anything that you're gonna do any kind of intensive work on, we'd suggest you do need to step up and take heed of our B660 motherboard recommendations to get the best all round PC. First up then, let's take a quick look at the criteria we've used to build this shortlist. We have chosen features and specifications that mean we can actually recommend the boards wholeheartedly, and that does get rid of a swathe of options both at the lower and higher end. First up, they've got to have a capable VRM for the CPU under consideration, and bear in mind that some of the entry and mid range boards in this review aren't suitable to run particularly the most powerful i7 CPUs. You should only really consider the entry level for i3s, mid-range for i5s, and the higher end boards for the i7s if that's what you want to run. There are some exceptions there, for example the MSI Pro B660M-A is capable of running the i7 CPUs perfectly well. We've only considered DDR4 motherboards and that's because the value proposition of this platform is completely wiped out by DDR5 RAM. And there are a number of boards in this review that also have DDR5 options, so do be careful which one you buy. We've only considered boards with four RAM slots, and that's just basic future-proofing to ensure that as your needs develop over time, you can make a cost-effective upgrade just by adding additional RAM to your system. That becomes more relevant as DDR4 RAM will get harder to find in coming years. We've only considered boards with two M.2 slots. We consider that a basic need now that SSDs are moving to that format, and NVMe drives have to be M.2. Two M.2 slots gives you a lot better future-proofing and upgradability. It allows you to clone one drive to another as you make upgrades in future, and generally speaking, we think it's a fundamental need now for any motherboard in a mid-range system. We've looked for a decent rear I.O. specification with sufficient fast USB ports, and ideally an internal USB 3.2 Gen 2 header as well. We've looked at the overall acceptability of the feature set, whether it's got boot diagnostic LEDs, the level of expandability afforded by the PCIe configuration, and features of that nature. 
And finally, we've considered availability. There are some boards that are listed on manufacturer's sites, but we've not seen them for sale anywhere yet. And that does seem to be a real problem with B660 at the moment. So we have taken the fact whether you can actually buy these boards into consideration as we've made our recommendations. And finally, a quick note on B660 motherboards and non-K series CPU overclocking. There has been some buzz around that, the fact that some boards have an external clock generator that allows you to set very high overclocks on non-K CPUs. Whilst it's an interesting quirk, it's something that we would say don't bother with if you're at all bothered about the value proposition of this platform and you're not a serious overclocker. It's not really a way to get sensible performance out of these CPUs. If that's what you want to do, then we'd strongly suggest you move to Z690 and a K-series CPU. You'll be able to get a much better overclocking platform for less money. If you're interested in setting benchmarks and world records, then by all means, get hold of an i3 and one of these expensive motherboards and DDR5 RAM and see how far you can go with it. For the general user though, it's not a sensible option. So first up amongst our recommendations then is the Gigabyte B660M DS3H DDR4. And this is a real entry level motherboard um, and we hesitate to recommend it. It really is for i3 CPUs only and only if you're really stuck for budget and you just want to get a platform and a PC up and running as cheaply as possible. It is cheap, it has three video outputs, and there is a Wi-Fi version available with this board as well to integrate that functionality. It does have two M.2 slots and a rear USB-C port. There's also a QFlash BIOS flash system to help you upgrade it. And if you do get this motherboard, you absolutely need to get the up-to-date BIOS on it because it underperforms badly with the BIOS it ships with. In terms of cons, there's the very basic VRM specification. It's only suitable for an i3 or an i5 if you run it at stock power limits with a 65 watt power cap on it. There's poor and inconsistent performance, both with the new BIOS and particularly on the original shipped BIOS. So be very careful with that. It's got an entry-level audio codec, the ALC897, very basic looks, only one full-length PCIe slot, only five rear USB-A ports. There's no internal USB 3.2 Gen 2 header, which means you can't connect those faster ports on the front of your case to it. And finally, it has no boot diagnostic LEDs on the motherboard. Overall, then, we do hesitate to recommend this board. It really is a, a board of last resort, and you should only really seek to run an i3 CPU on it. That said, once you've updated that BIOS, it does do an acceptable job and it has a what we'd consider a marginal overall feature set. So if it's what you can get and what you can afford, it will do the job. Moving on to boards that get a more hearty recommendation, the Asus Prime B660M-A DDR4 is a board with a decent basic feature set. It uses silver heat sinking, which can fit with some builds quite nicely at a lower price point. There's three full length PCIe slots, but do be aware that two of them are only PCIe 3x4 and PCIe 3x1, but the full length slot does just mean you can fit a wider variety of cards in them. There are three display outputs, two of them are HDMI, and there is also a Wi Fi version of this board available, and it does have full heat sinking on that model rather than the partial heat sinking we see on this one. The negatives of this board are that it does have a weaker VRM specification. We've tested it with an i5 and it does fine, but we wouldn't recommend running an i7 CPU on it. There's only two fast USB-A ports at the rear and there's no USB-C. It also has that entry-level audio, the ALC897 again. Another problem with this board is just that the boot code diagnostic display is provided by flashing the power button. So that's an additional thing you have to make sure you've wired up correctly, make sure that your power light is correctly wired onto the motherboard in order that you get the important diagnostic information if you do have a problem when you've come to first boot the PC. And finally, the Asus Prime range is really confusing and it's very difficult to navigate and know exactly what you're getting. As an example, there's also the Plus version of this board, which we'll talk about in the moment, and also some Dash E versions. And in other markets, there's also the Dash K version as well. So be sure of exactly what you're purchasing when you pick this board. And it's the B660M-A that is our preferred option with a balance of features and price. Moving on then to the Asus Prime B660 Plus D4. This is the full ATX uh, option and it does have heat sinking around the entire VRM, although it has still got a VRM specification that realistically would only trust with an i5 CPU and we wouldn't run an i7 CPU off of this for demanding all core workloads. There is a Wi-Fi option available and this model comes with three M.2 slots. There's also rear USB-C on it, although it still does only have two fast and one very fast USB-C on the rear. The negatives of this board are just that weaker VRM specification, that the two lower PCIe slots are just 3.0 times one. 
and it's again got this entry level ALC897 audio on it which is pretty standard for the B660 range and finally of course just the confusion around the prime range again if you're looking for this board make sure it is specifically this board and the DDR4 version that you are getting moving on with mid-range B660 motherboard recommendations we've got the B660M Steel Legend from ASRock this board again has full silver heat sinking and should fit quite a number of uh, nice looking builds in white cases because of that it's got an acceptable VRM which is a 9 phase 50 amp DR MOS setup and we haven't tested this directly but there's no reason why it shouldn't run an i5 to full potential there are two m.2 slots and it's got four rear usb a 3.2 gen 1 at 5 gigabit per second there are also six sata ports on this board which is a nice find on an m80x board the negatives around this board are that we haven't tested it directly and therefore we can't vouch for its performance and also again it has entry level alc897 and no rear usb c and finally we come on to our recommended boards for this sector of the market the msi pro b660 m-a ddr4 and the msi mag b660 m bazooka they're basically the same motherboard all of their key specifications are the same and you can choose one or the other based on which is cheaper or which you like the look of better or availability in your market they have the same two m.2 slots and the same pcie configuration there's also a strong VRM configuration, and this is the cheaper motherboard that is i7 capable. It will happily run an i7-12700 or 12700K to full potential, which is good for the price point. It's got 2.5 gigabit LAN, two faster USB-A ports, 10 gigabits per second, two mid-speed at 5 gigabit per second, and two USB-2 ports at the rear. The MSI Pro-A has four display outputs. And there are actually circumstances I can imagine that would be quite useful. There's two HDMIs and two DisplayPort outputs. And if you pair this with a non-F CPU, it does mean you can get good quality display output for an office or multi-monitor setup. Again, we see it as the entry-level audio, the ALC897, and these boards lack BIOS flashback. That's not a direct problem since they perform very well out of the box, but it is something to be aware of if you do need to update BIOS. If you're finding this video useful so far, please do subscribe to our channel and hit like on the video. It helps us out immensely and it helps us continue to bring you this kind of information, including the testing we do ourselves, to make sure you're getting the best value for money as you choose PC parts. Another mid-range board that we've tested directly is the Asus TUF B660M-E D4. This has a 10-phase DigiPlus VRM with partial heat sinking, and we have tested it and found it perfectly capable of running i5 CPUs. We would just caution that it's probably not the best option for an i7. We'd look back to the MSI Pro B660M-A for that. There's Wi-Fi options for this board available, and the rear USB out is pretty decent. It's got six USB-A ports in total, but no USB-C. There's some nice little RGB highlights on the board. It's got a decent selection of fan headers and system fan headers as well, so that you can cool a gaming build. Once again, we're looking at the entry-level ALC897 for audio as a slight disadvantage, and this just confusing TUF range with a lot of options, so be very careful of what you're buying if you're looking at this board. Stepping up, the Asus TUF B660M Plus D4 is a slight upgrade to the M E. It's got a 10 phase DR MOS VRM with full heat sinking this time, and this is a board we would be happy running an i7 CPU on. There's three PCIe slots it's PCIe 5.0 for the main GPU slot in this instance, and then the two more normal PCIe 3x4 and 1x1 slots beneath. There is again a Wi-Fi option of this board available, and there's four 10 gigabit USB-A at the rear, which is a nice addition, and a USB-C port as well. It has those same RGB highlights in the board, and there are again a good range of fan headers in order to cool your system. The Gigabyte B660M Gaming X is in a bit of a strange position. It appears to be quite cheap when it is available, but it's a strong mid-range specification. It's got an 8-phase DR MOS VRM with good heat sinking, and there's again a Wi-Fi option available. It has a really strong rear I.O. with 8 USB ports available, 3 of them at 5 gigabits per second, and it's got decent fan headers as well. There's a nice pre-installed I.O. shield which helps with setting up the PC. Again, we see it's got the ALC897 audio codec, we believe, although it's not specified directly, and it has no USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports at the rear. It does only have two PCIe slots, and the lower one is slightly awkwardly located, but for a single GPU system, this is fine. Do also beware that there's a non-X version of this board available. It's very different in specification and much lower spec, and it's really only i3 suitable. Moving up into the upper mid-range, we've got the MSI B660M Mortar and Mortar Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi model has silver heat sinking, if that's your preferred aesthetic. This has a very strong 12 phase VRM and it's very capable. It'll happily run the i7 CPUs just like the Pro A beneath it. There are seven USB ports at the rear, one of them is 10 gigabits per second, two of them are 5 gigabits per second, and then there's four USB 2 ports and it has USB C on the rear I.O. 
There's a pre-installed I.O. shield and six SATA ports. Do beware that DDR5 versions of this board exist again, and it only has two chassis fan headers, so do make sure if you're running a number of fans for your cooling system that you've got either a fan hub or a splitter cable to power them all adequately. It is also pretty expensive as far as boards go, and this is really reaching towards the upper end of what we'd be willing to spend on a B660 motherboard. Again in the upper mid-range, we've got the Gigabyte B660M Aorus Pro AX DDR4. This board uses a strong 12 phase, although it's doubled DR MOS 60 amp VRM with heat sinking, and this is an i7 capable VRM, we'd have no problems running that CPU on it. There's also a non Wi Fi option available, and it has a really strong rear panel configuration. There's nine USB A ports at the rear, one of them's 10 gigabit per second, four of them are 5 gigabit per second, and four of them are USB 2. And there's also a USB Type C port on the rear as well. It's got a decent range of headers for fans and system uh, cooling pumps. There's also some nice RGB highlights around the chipset heatsink. The negatives to this board are just that we can't fully identify the audio codec, so we're assuming it's an ALC897. The rear audio panel is the only weak part of that, with just a microphone in and a line out. They're obviously relying on the front panel connector to give you your audio. And it does again only have two PCIe slots. If you need Wi-Fi, make sure that you get the Wi-Fi version so that you still have an expansion slot free. And again, beware that DDR5 versions of this board also exist. Moving to the upper end of B660 motherboards, we've got the Gigabyte B660 Aorus Master DDR4. This board really does have an overkill VRM, it's a 16 phase, although it's double DR MOS 60 amp VRM, with heat sinking on it as well. It has strong rear I.O. with 9 USB-A ports at the rear, 10 gigabits per second, 4 5 gigabits per second, and 4 USB 2. There's also USB-C on the rear panel. This is one of the few boards we've identified that has a slightly better quality ALC1200 audio codec, and it's also got a full rear output panel as well. Got a strong set of fan headers with four system fan headers in addition to the CPU fan and pump header. It's got three M.2 slots, which is pretty unusual on the B660 range. And there's some RGB highlights on the board as well. The negatives with this board are that it only has four SATA ports, and it comes bundled with some slightly dubious software. And again, you just want to watch out that you don't end up with the DDR5 version by mistake. The MSI B660 Tomahawk has a 12 phase VRM with good heat sinking, and again, this is an i7 capable board. There's eight USB A ports at the rear, four of them are 10 gigabits per second, and four of them are USB 2. It's got USB C on the rear panel and the ALC1200 audio codec with a full rear audio output panel. There's one CPU fan header, one pump header, and five system fan headers, which gives you great flexibility in how you set up the fans on your system without the need for additional hubs or splitter cables. There's also a pre-installed IO shield, and this board again has three M.2 slots. The negatives to this board are just that you might want to watch out for the DDR5 versions. It is relatively expensive as B660 motherboards go, and there are no RGB accents on this board, although you might consider that a plus. In the upper range of the B660 motherboards, the motherboard with white aesthetics that we'd consider is the Asus ROG Strix B660-A. This board has a strong 12-phase DigiPlus VRM, although it is doubled. The rear USB is strong, with seven USB-A ports, one of them is 10 gigabit per second, two of them are 5 gigabit per second, and it's got four USB 2.0. There's also two USB-C on the rear panel, one of them is the full 20 gigabits per second, and the other is 10 gigabits per second. There are three M.2 slots on this board, and four PCIe slots total and it uses the higher end ALC4080 codec. The cons are that it does only have four SATA ports and it's absolutely as expensive as we'd want to go for a B660 motherboard. If you're looking at ITX motherboards, your options are severely limited in the B660 range, which is a real shame. The only budget board available is the ASRock B660M-ITXAC, and we're only really showing it here not as a recommendation, but just as an awareness of the compromises you will make if you do choose this board. It is the only affordable MITX B660 motherboard. It has inbuilt Wi-Fi, which all MITX boards do, and it has a USB 3.2 front panel header. The negatives of this board are multiple really. It has a weak VRM and we'd only really trust it with an i3 CPU given our experience of other ASRock lower end boards. It's got a pretty miserable specification. There's just one M.2 slot, four USB-A ports at the rear. And then of course there's all the normal compromises you do expect with a MITX board. The fact it's only got two RAM slots, one PCIe slot, four SATA slots, and just a fairly basic all round specification. This board really is a board of last resort. It's what you would choose if you needed to put a i3 CPU into a small form factor system for some reason but that really is all it's good for. In terms of sensible options, if you want a more fully featured board, there is only really one choice. That's the Gigabyte B660i Aorus Pro DDR4. This is basically the only good MITX B660 board. It's got a fairly decent eight phase 90 amp power delivery. There's a USB 3.2 front panel header, and it's got a strong rear IO. 
There's seven USB-A ports, one of them at 10 gigabits per second, four of them at five gigabits per second, and two USB-2 ports. The negatives are that it does only have one M.2 slot, and it's only got one system fan header, but it does also have an AIO pump header, so you can power additional devices that way. Overall, this is the board we would opt for if you want ITX on the B660 platform. All of the other boards are DDR5 only, and really overpriced considering the features that they offer. Finally, we come onto our wall of shame. These are the boards we really think you do need to avoid for one reason or another. First up, we've got the ASRock HDV, and to a lesser extent, the Pro RS as well. These are boards with inadequate VRMs. They've been shown to really underperform severely, and they're just not worth your money. There's the ASUS ROG range, which ASUS have chosen to make DDR5 only, with the exception of the board we've mentioned. And that's a real shame. It means these good looking and uh, popular boards are really not viable options because they're just incredibly bad value by the time you've purchased DDR5 RAM as well. Keep an eye out for boards like the ASUS B660M-K, although it's a little bit cheaper than the boards we've recommended, it's got a pretty inadequate specification and an inadequate VRM for the i5. Is not a board that we'd recommend unless you do find it very cheap and only want to run an i3. MSI have also got some entry boards that lack any heat sinking on the VRMs and for that reason although it's not a bad VRM setup we would just caution against them particularly for any demanding workloads. They also have reduced specification across the board, they're more aimed at the commercial market for office PCs and things of that nature. And finally there's the Gigabyte B660 Gaming Non-X. Whilst we've recommended the X version, the gaming is a really cut back option and it's just a D2H in lipstick with some red heat sinking and slots on it. It's got a weak overall specification and it's not a board we'd recommend. So that concludes our recommendations and to round up, the B660 motherboard landscape really is a bit of a mess. However, by sorting the wheat from the chaff, applying our specifications for boards we recommend otherwise, and avoiding value traps like poor quality VRMs or boards that require DDR5, basically gets you the shortlist we've presented here. We're confident that these recommendations represent good value for money options that will perform with the CPUs we've recommended. You can buy outside of our recommendations, particularly if you're only looking to run an i3 CPU, but do be aware of some of the compromises you might be making with either specification or performance with a later upgrade. If you choose a board now that runs an i3 okay, but that's gonna struggle with an i5, that means that that's just a path that's maybe closed down to you in future. If you don't think you're gonna upgrade though, it's a sensible way to save some money now. The MSI Pro B660M-A or Bazooka paired with an i5-12600K or an i5-12700 gets our bang for buck recommendation. That's a fantastic pairing, the board's very capable, and those CPUs outperform everything from Intel's flagships in previous generations at a much lower cost. So if you're looking for a really high performance system but don't want to stretch to Z690 and some of the higher end K CPUs, then we'd recommend that as a great all round content, content production PC or a very strong gaming PC. The real value traps out there involve mainly DDR5 RAM. If you're looking to buy a B660 motherboard and an i5-12400, for example, for the value that they provide, then you absolutely need to avoid DDR5 because that obliterates the value proposition of this platform. That means that basically none of the ASUS ROG boards, for example, are able to be recommended. They almost all, apart from the one we've recommended here, take DDR5 RAM, and that means you've got to commit to spending another $300 minimum for RAM that performs worse than good DDR4 RAM available today. If you do find yourself looking at DDR5 RAM and you're willing to bear that cost, then we'd suggest that you really need to step up to the Z690 platform. You can get yourself an i5K or an i7K CPU, Z690 motherboard, and even again DDR4 RAM, and you'll get a much better performing system all round for a lower cost. In fact, as soon as your B660 motherboard spend creeps up past $200, that's the point at which we'd advise you switch over and start to look at entry-level Z690 boards instead. They offer much better feature sets and value, and that's where our money would go above $200. If none of these boards are getting you excited, and we can understand that, then remember that the value proposition as a whole has to be looked at in terms of the entire system. So don't forget that the AMD Ryzen 5600X still exists. At the time of release of Alder Lake, that was a $300 CPU, but it's had price cuts now down to around $200 to $220, and there are still some great B550 motherboards. So you could choose that CPU, a B550 motherboard with a feature set that's equal or better to any of the B660 motherboards in this test, and then you'll be able to build a fantastic and high-performance PC around that platform instead. 
We've got our own recommendations for B550 motherboards, which you can check out in our video. I'll link it in the corner above. And it means that you'll be able to get a fantastic system. And I assure you, you won't notice a difference in performance between an Intel i5-12400 and an AMD Ryzen 5600X. You will have an equivalent experience on both. And if the price falls in favor of the AMD Ryzen, then that's the option you should take. I really hope you found this video informative. Please do like and subscribe if you have. We've got loads of additional content coming up and you can check out premiumbuilds.com as well, where we've got advice guides to assist you in building your next PC.